Hello, thank you very much for including me today. Um, I'm also very excited to be at the first OpenCon event for 2017 and support ECS's Free the Science Initiative, uh, which is an innovative and really important action. I'd like to take a little bit of time today to talk a bit about the background of Dryad for those of you who I don't think are going to be familiar with it and point out a few um, synergies that I see between the movements of open access and the movements of o around open data. There are challenges to making things uh, open, and open data is particularly challenging in that it's a very diverse output in general terms. But it's our strong conviction that open science isn't open without data. So first, to give you a perspective of the nonprofit that I represent, I'll quickly give you a description of what we do. Dryad is a digital repository, and we link data to scholarly articles. Uh, this is a screenshot of the home page with the location where you can submit articles. Is that going to work? Oh, sorry, I went backwards. There we are. Um, where you can submit um, data and uh, through the uh, upper right-hand button. And you can also browse for data. And we have currently almost 19,000 data packages in our system. This is made up of many files that represent uh, over 66,000 authors and more than 630 different journals. All data published in Dryad is open and available to view, download, and reuse. There's no restrictions. And a few unique features of Dryad is that every data package is linked out to uh, some kind of scholarly article, book chapter, thesis, something that's gone through some series, some amount of peer review. Another is that all data has been curated by a trained human professional curator. Dryad focuses on curated quality data that's associated with publications rather than data that's still in um, some uh, various stages of collection or collaboration, analysis or study. And we work to integrate data submission system with various manuscript submission systems to enable easy data publication with the workflow. And we've done this with all the major manuscript submission systems, such as Editorial Manager, Scholar One, eJournal Press, Bench Press, and some other um, proprietary systems. In addition, Dryad is a nonprofit, and we're governed by a board of directors and organizational members who are encouraged to join Dryad and have a say in the future of the organization and to vote on board appointments. The idea is that the organization itself and the infrastructure is governed by stakeholders that are in um, scholarly communications and who are devoted to open. Okay. Dryad also has a business model and this supports the open access of all data in Dryad. We charge a data publication charge or a DPC and this pays for the storage hosting, sustainability, and human curation of all data in Dryad. The fee for an individual is 120 US dollars, and there are bulk plans for societies and funders, institutions, publishers, and we waive fees for those in developing countries. And a large effort that I put forth is to increase the number of organizations which sponsor that DPC on behalf of their community. So one thing that I find compelling uh, are similar motivations between the movements around freeing articles or open access and open data. The movement for open access journals came from a real frustration researchers experienced when they uh, were able to find some information on a study but hit roadblocks or paywalls when trying to gain the rest of the information. Out of this grew the recognition that there was a need for a new paradigm. And so a new business model emerged, which is what we see today as open access journals. But now we see this business model continuing to evolve and become more open. Things are shifting, adapting to newer ideas and newer models. Open access journals or publications also needed to gain traction to get wider adoption. And this was, you know, for some, a culture shift. The result, as is from most culture shifts, is a kind of fracture between advocates and opponents. And when a culture shift begins to take hold and get more um, buy-in, then there begins to be more advocates and fewer and fewer that are speaking out against. This is similar to open data as well. 
And in addition, both open access and open data have a need for new business models. How, how is this going to actually work? How are we going to figure out how to make this work? So both movements are steeped in the desire to gain access to the entire science, the need and challenges surrounding a culture shift, and of course the very practical piece of how do we get this to work. How are we assured that it's going to continue to be available in the future? And how do we create some successful business model out of it? Again, the motivation for open data is similar to open access, but it has some very serious distinctions. The general motivation for open data is not because whenever a researcher went to examine data that supports an article, they found themselves behind a paywall. It's much more serious for open data. Without open infrastructure for data, the scholarship which an article or argument is based on is simply not there. It disappears. So this is much scarier. The idea that the actual information gleaned from a study could disappear and no longer be available. So open data isn't simply a movement to free data from various paywalls or restrictions, but first and foremost, it's a desire to preserve, to retain, and even to save data from disappearing and to share and free data from restrictions around use. Looking at this slide, it was taken from a 2013 study and you can see that without archiving data in a repository and making it available, the likelihood of finding that data falls dramatically each year as research articles age. So without publishing, we lose 17% of our data every year. In fact, the likelihood of finding an author's email itself falls 7% every year. This study highlights that relying on asking the author for access is a non-policy. So if you care about open science and you've not addressed open data yet, then I suggest we still have a little more to go. Papers can be made open, and that's important, but if you're linking to closed resources or not showing any data at all, then we're still essentially at square one. An open access journal that does not link to open outputs does not fully accomplish your goals. Here are a few examples of data that do not have natural homes of their own and would be lost without the kind of infrastructure that Dryad provides. And we aren't really just talking about archiving here. All data, if, the, if it supports arguments in the paper, need to be accessible. And accessibility now is digital. Researchers don't dig through files by hand. If data is not labeled and described properly, if it is not discoverable by machines and understandable by humans, it's still in danger of disappearing. For example, how many important files are now in supplemental material that are not tagged with metadata, do not have individual object identifiers pointing to them, and are basically invisible to anyone who might want to access them? These examples on these slides are um, featured data. These are regular tweets that Dryad sends out to highlight the breadth of the data that we see in our repository to promote data publishing and reuse and to contribute to conversations online around this. The data set on the left uh, from the Royal Society is a study on urban sounds and related social media posts to map out possible relation between sounds and emotion. And the one on the right is around a disaster event. This is from Hurricane Sandy. And this is a PLOS study, and it looks specifically at disaster awareness. It makes recommendations on possible improvements for planning and recovery. So I'm thrilled to be part of this group of open science leaders and to support the ECS's Free the Science Initiative and to help kick off OpenCon but I'd like to take a moment just to think on the meaning of the words free and open in order to consider how we can further open science with open data and to be honest in our struggles around this. I picked out a few definitions about free in particular that seem to be best applied to our usage today. For instance, not bound, confined, not detained, open to all comers, not costing anything to access, for example. The word open also has many meanings, and I'm focusing on a few appropriate ones for today. For instance, not confining a barrier, adjusted to permit passage, exposed, and I especially like the use of generous here. Removing barriers from science and generously allowing complete access is the goal. However, the elephant in the room here is that we need to acknowledge that open is not free. There are resources that are needed to change a paradigm and to make things open. 
and you also need to continue to support the availability of open in the long term. At one point in the past, we may have allowed an individual researcher to upload data to a personal web page and make it available. And this could nearly have no cost. Maybe a home page that's $5 every four years or something like that. Well, that's no longer satisfactory and for very good reasons. That solution doesn't provide metadata that allows that web page to be surfaced in the ways that academics need. It does not provide any security for being available five or ten years later. There's no identifier that's pointing to that data. There's no provenance around it. How do you know it wasn't changed? Someone may never have reviewed it. Um, is there proprietary information inside? And so on and so on. Like the research article, there is much that can and ought to be done around data to ensure it is of archival and publishable quality. And these efforts, even when very light, take resources. Last year, Dryad concluded a short-term funding pilot with the US National Science Foundation. And we uh, wanted to test the feasibility of what it would be like for a funder to pay directly for a data publication. We were interested in the struggle around identifying resources to make data open as well. And the goal was to inform the NSF and ourselves around the level of effort that this would require in technical terms and in workflow terms. We wanted to know um, also more about the habits and the challenges and the preferences of our researchers. During this period, we received nearly 400 data submissions that fell into this pilot. Uh, the US National Science Foundation put funds aside to pay for the data publication charge instead of charging the individuals. And these 400 submissions were able to benefit from that and represented about 15% of our submissions in total. We think we would have gotten much more if the project ran longer, it was short term, and if it was advertised for a longer period. So as part of the study, we also surveyed those who paid for the data publication charge on their own and were not part of those 400. They did not participate in the test group of those who were able to deposit for free. We wanted to know how hard was it for these researchers to pay for their data costs? Did they have a data management plan? Uh, it, and if they did, you know, what, how did they plan for these things? We were interested in how difficult was it to get reimbursed? And where did these funds come from? And we wanted to extrapolate trends from this group to the rest of the data that we see in Dryad. So our survey had a 27% response rate, which indicates that these questions about paying for data and planning for this effort was of great interest to our researchers. So what did we find out? Well, nearly three quarters of data that we see is currently supported by some kind of funding. And the most common funding agencies are displayed here in a word cloud that highlight the most common. But despite this funding being available, again, open data, it turns out, is not free. Despite this, many researchers have a hard time paying for data. So why is it so hard? Well, you can see on the left um, block here that 46% of respondents did commit to archiving data as part of their, this is the NSF funders data management plan. But only 4% of them actually had a budget in place for archiving. So this is a massive gap. This suggests that in general, a large portion of data is associated with a funded project. And plans are in place to comply with requirements to archive the data. But nearly no one is budgeting resources around this. In addition, and this is the um, graph shown on the right side, almost half, 41% of those respondents said they archived their data after the grant period expired, while almost 60% were unable to or were unsure what they were going to do. In fact, over 15% of our participants indicated that they had collected data in the last two years and had been unable to archive it because of lack of funds. So no wonder it's difficult. Researchers then are left to cobble together funds to pay for the data publication charge, which in this case is uh, fairly modest, 120 US dollars. They complain that they have to beg for money. They cover it themselves because getting reimbursed is way too difficult, or that they simply cannot be reimbursed. I'm sure that some of these quotes sound familiar to the researchers here in the audience, and it was very frustrating to, to get some of this feedback from our, our users. 
So it's no wonder then that when a society or publisher sponsors the DPCs in Dryad for their community, that researchers are beginning to take notice. The key takeaways that we learned by surveying the group of researchers who were paying for DPCs with Dryad on their own are that there's the bulk of responsibility for this is on the heads of the researchers, that identifying resources to support and open data is necessary and essential, that funders should consider how to support data costs knowing that papers and other outputs are often coming out and being published after the grant period expires, and that publishers also have a place in supporting these costs and sponsoring DPCs on behalf, of dry, on behalf of their community. And if they do support DPCs in Dryad, researchers are beginning to take notice and actually prefer these journals. But one of the most encouraging takeaways are, despite the difficulties around making data open or paying for it on your own, and often the lack of support, is that scientists care enough about this to take extra steps to overcome obstacles to make their data open, to do it on their own, to go through all of that pain. And to me, this shows a real commitment to making things open and furthering science, and it doubles down our commitment to remove some of the friction in the process. So it's important to po point out that in general terms, scientists already support open data. This research um, came out in 2011, and at that time it suggested that scientists are willing to share data, they're comfortable with doing so with other other disciplines, and they're happy if data is being used in different ways. And in exchange, they want their data to be cited. So supporting open data as, a, as part of supporting open science is now pushing at an open door. However, we still need to work together. Publishers, repositories, funders, and researchers all need to help fund this effort, plan for this effort, and ensure that it continues. I applaud the Free the Science Initiative as a thoughtful and exciting way to do this, and I'm excited to see what comes out of it. Freeing the science will be more impactful when also supporting opening up data. But making things open, discoverable, providing archival support and quality requires some care and feeding. We agree on the importance of open. However, if you share the goal of open science and support the notion that we can come together, let's improve our practice. Let us work together. Groups like Dryad, Spark, Center for Open Science, and funders are adept at, or at least experienced, with culture change. We can learn with you to adapt and improve business models, to encourage others to participate, and to get back to what the originators of the open access and the open data movements had in mind. Free the science, support this activity for the long term and for the future. Thank you. <laughs>